Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. I'm Steve Orme, the Midlands Editor of the British Theatre Guide. Adam Penford has taken over as Artistic Director of Nottingham Playhouse. The 37-year-old had been working as a freelance director and replaces Giles Croft, who'd been at the helm of the Playhouse for the past 18 years. Penford says he's thrilled to have been given the job. It was nine o'clock in the morning and I got a call from Stephanie Sir, the chief exec, uh, saying that I'd been successful. I was kind of shocked, actually, and amazed. I, I didn't know whether... I didn't think I had it in the bag, for example. I thought it had gone well. But, um, yeah, but it was a really overwhelming response, really. I phoned my parents and told them because they, they live in Nottingham and they didn't know I was up for the role. I kept it quiet until I found out I had it. So why do you want to be an artistic director in a theatre as opposed to being a freelance director or being involved in any other way? Yeah, so I've been a freelance theatre director for 15 years now and I've loved it. It allows you to do a wide range of work, an eclectic range of um, organisations and buildings. But, you know, I was first introduced to theatre um, as a child by coming to the Nottingham Playhouse. I used to come and see the pantomime with my family. And then when I was a teenager, I used to come with my youth theatre and see a whole wide variety of work. And I always had a real love for the, for the building. So I always thought one day I'd love to be an artistic director and I always thought the ideal venue would be the Nottingham Playhouse and, and that's how it worked out. You lived in Nottingham for 18 years. You went away for 18 years so what's it like to be back now? <laughs> um, in some ways, it hasn't changed at all. The city, it feels exactly the same as when I left. I, when I left, when I first went to drama school aged 18, I met a lot of people who were really pleased to be away from their hometown. I think they'd outgrown it. They were ready to stretch their wings. But I never really had that with Nottingham. I still loved the city when I left it and enjoyed coming back. But of course, in the 18 years I've been away, it has, it has changed massively as well. So some things feel really similar, some things feel very different. It's still got the same heart and spirit that I recognise from growing up here. But it's the whole place is sort of, as with all cities, particularly northern cities, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, you, you see uh, uh, the way that they've developed over the last couple of decades. And there's a real vitality to it as a as a city and actually the East Midlands regionally. So, yeah. You've announced your first season as Artistic Director, not just a first season, but a first year. Why did you decide to go that far ahead? Yeah, so normally, well, Nottingham Playhouse, and indeed most theatres follow the model of doing um, three season announcements per year. But one of the first things I decided when I was in post and had my first meetings with the organisation, the staff here, was that it... Because Giles has been artistic director here for 18 years, which is a, a long time for an artistic director, it would be good to announce a whole year's worth of work to really show a, a shift in the artistic vision for the, for the venue. And by doing a whole year's programme, it kind of allows you to tell a whole story. So you get to show a wide range of work. So audiences and people in Nottingham really understand the changes that are happening for the theatre. Whereas if you're just doing it piecemeal, a couple of two or three shows at a time you, it doesn't really tell a whole narrative there are downsides which is that it's a huge amount of work for everybody in the theatre to put a whole year's programme together in one go so <laughs> that we, but they, everyone rose to the challenge we had the season launch last week it seemed to go very well um, so yeah we, we were delighted with it some people might be surprised that you've managed to get Mark Gatiss to come and play the lead in The Madness of, of George III so how on earth did you manage it? I've worked with Mark before. So I knew that I wanted to end the year, so we're talking 2018, I wanted to end the year with a big play, um, something quite spectacular. And I've always been a fan of Alan Bennett's. I particularly love Madness of George III. I think it's a modern classic. But I knew that I wouldn't want to programme it unless I knew who was going to play the title character because that's like programming Hamlet without knowing who's going to play Hamlet for you. So... Quite quickly, when I started to think about actors who could play it, uh, I thought of Mark Gatiss. He's, he, he's got the wit and the intellect and the, the, the comic chops, I guess, to play uh, Alan Bennett's witty dialogue. But he also has a... He's not afraid to go to a slightly dark side. And actually, 
George III isn't a wholly sympathetic character. He's quite belligerent and, and pretty grumpy. Uh, and Mark can bring that side to it as well. So he's an actor of real range. And I just offered it him. And it turns out he'd always coveted the role. He knew Nottingham Playhouse's work, we'd worked together before, and he was happy to sign up 18 months in advance. So we're, you know, we're very lucky, the truth is. 18 months ahead, though, so you must feel privileged that he's committing himself and then anything else that comes along, he might have to turn it down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's, yeah he'll have to work around the commitment here. So we are, we're really privileged. I mean, he's, you know, he's very much in demand. You know, he's an Olivier Award winner, so his stage work is well known at the National Theatre at the Domar Warehouse. But also, obviously, he's most probably well known for his screen work for starring and writing and producing Sherlock, Doctor Who, uh, League of Gentlemen, which is coming back this Christmas. Yeah, it's a real privilege. Is it difficult, though, to get actors, directors, designers to come into the provinces when there's so much to keep them in London? Yeah, that's a real challenge. I mean, it is, and, you know, the fact that I've only just stopped being a freelance theatre director myself and for the first time in my life have a salaried position. I appreciate that because one of the big reasons is that you are more guaranteed working in London that people will come and see your work. So be that theatre critics, be that media, be that other people who could employ you, i.e. producers, artistic directors of other venues. So, you know, it's a real, a major plus to working in London. Plus, it's easier to attract star actors or leading actors to the projects if they're based in London. The money, you know, isn't great regionally, the truth is. Um, everybody's being squeezed by local authorities, but the local authorities are being squeezed by the government. That's a, you know, and the, the Arts Council does a huge amount to support. But I think it is. I think it is tricky to attract directors and designers. But it's about being canny and, and you know, making in terms of your choice of titles that we're programming and then the directors or choreographers or actors that we're speaking to about doing those productions, it's about maybe offering people an opportunity that they might not necessarily get to do that genre of work, for example, in, in London. So how would you describe your first season, the, uh, the, the plays and the productions that you've chosen? Overall, it's, it's a deliberately a very varied season. I wanted to make sure that there was something for everybody. Or, if, like me, when I used to come to Nottingham Playhouse as a teenager, you come and see pretty much everything, you really do get to see a, a wide variety of work, both in terms of genre. So we're doing a family show, we're doing a musical next year. It's the first time that Nottingham Playhouse has pro lead produced a musical, and we're doing Sweet Charity. The family show is Holes, which is an adaptation of an award-winning novel by Louis Sacker that some people know because of the Disney film. But we're also doing, uh, we're starting the season with a regional premiere, which is Wonderland by local writer Beth Steele. Uh, I was at the Hampstead Theatre in 2014, but this is the regional premiere. It's set in Nottingham. She's from Nottingham. It's about the miners' strike. Her dad was a Nottinghamshire miner. So it's, it's, it's a really eclectic range of work. It's, there's new writing, there's regional premieres, there's musical, there's family drama, there's modern classics like George III. So it's deliberately popular. I think it felt really important to me that as a programme, the audience would be entertained and have a good night out. But there are also provocations in there. So politically or sociopolitically, there's, there are themes and plays which will challenge the audience, I think. And that's what theatre should be doing. Is it difficult to sort out a programme that will appeal to new audiences as well as to your existing audience? Um... I don't think it's difficult, but it has to be a consideration. Nottingham Playhouse does reasonably well in terms of selling tickets, you know, bums on seats. <laughs> but you can't always play it safe. And actually, I think audiences are really clever. I think they like to be provoked. So Nottingham Playhouse, previously, you know, our best-selling dramas have been The Kite Runner, 1984, which Rob Ike directed for Headlong, touched with Vicky McClure earlier this year. Um, you know, there's some challenging pieces of work. So and the audiences came. So they don't they do want to be challenged. They do want to experience new things. We do have a core audience. Of course we do. But I, they have they already have varied tastes. So I think 
I think there is room for audience di- development. All theatres need to be diversifying their audience and we definitely need to be attracting young audiences in as well to the audiences for the future. But I don't think it's difficult. I just think it has to be a consideration. You mentioned Beth Steele and Wonderland, mm. which you're directing yourself. So is there a, a particular format that, that you choose when you're directing? Is there a particular style that we can relate to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, if you look at my CV, it's really eclectic, which genuinely reflects the fact that I have eclectic taste in theatre. So I have directed musical theatre, I have directed new writing, I have directed classics, directed things, family shows. Uh, I was an associate artist at Polka Theatre, Children's Theatre in London for for several years. I worked on One Man, Two Governors at the National Theatre. So, you know, I've done farce. So in terms of genre, no, I, I have genuinely varied tastes. I don't think I have an aesthetic. I mean, I know the thing that appealed to me within Wonderland, one of the things that appealed to me as a director is, although there are scenes of naturalism within it, and Beth writes amazing dialogue, it's really funny and powerful. It is heightened in form, uh, by which I mean there is music, there's songs, there's big challenges, directorial challenges, where she'll suddenly write that there's a, I don't know, the roof of the mine collapses. And you have to, or there's a big riot on stage, and you have to work out how you're going to stage that. If you were doing the movie version with million pound budget and uh, you know 300 extras, you would do it naturalistically probably. But you don't have that option on stage, so it, it forces you in a good way, in a positive way, to be creative um, and to make creative decisions. So that slightly heightened theatricality is something that appeals to me. I like working with heightened movement. I like working with music. The multi-locational nature of Wonderland is a great challenge. It means the world can't be uh, interpreted naturally through the design. So, yeah, so I guess there is an essence of theatricality that maybe is in every production I do. Three of the eight productions that uh, you announced are written by women, is that a ratio that you're happy with or do you intend to change that in any way? Um, I mean, yes. I think female writers are still underrepresented on stage across the world, actually, but, you know, focusing in the UK. It was deliberate when we were programming to look at the gender balance, uh, not just in terms of writers, actually, in terms of the creative teams we're employing, in terms of the casting, and to get as close to a 50-50 split as possible. So I'm really proud that three of the eight projects next year are by female writers. It was something we deliberately set out to do, and, and you know, I'd like to see it get to 50-50 in the future, actually. Is it important to programme work by local playwrights? Yeah. Absolutely. I think, you know, Nottingham has produced some great writers. You know, William Ivory popped straight into my head because we've been talking to him about something else recently. But there's many others, Andy Barrett, John Harvey. But I think uh, there's also younger writers coming through. So one of the plays next year, Shabin, is by a local writer, Mafara Makabika. He's done work in our studio before. This is his first main stage commission, uh, not just at Nottingham Playhouse, you know, ever. Giles commissioned him. I inherited various commissions from Giles, some of which I've moved forward with, some of which I haven't. Mafara's was one that is just a great play. It's set in St Anne's, so it's a local story against the backdrop of the race riots in 1958. Not everybody knows that Nottingham had the first race riot. They predated the Notting Hill riots by a week. So to be championing here in Mofaro's work is fantastic. And we've also been looking at how to work with other new writing companies, both locally. So we're doing a, a co-producing with Fifth Word, which is one a local theatre company who's one of our associate artists. Uh, we're doing James Fritz's play Lava in the Neville studio next year. So working with them to produce new writing. But I'm also looking at collaborations with other new writing companies as well for the future. So we can bring the best of new writing to the city, but also take our amazing local writers out nationally into London so they get more exposure. So yeah, new writing is, is sort of key to the, it's the lifeblood of theatre really, so it's absolutely key to programming next year and going forward. You mentioned Sweet Charity, are you expecting to do any more musicals after that? Yeah, I, I, mean, I love musical theatre. I think, you know, we had Tommy last year, which was part of the Ramps on the Moon consortium project, which was an amazing production and audiences adored it. So 
we know that there's an audience for musical theatre, although Notting Playhouse haven't particularly done a lot of musicals over the last couple of decades. I would absolutely see a musical theatre as being a staple of our programme going forward. And next year, you know, what I've always loved about Sweet Charity is it's about a strong working class female protagonist who's... Uh, unwilling to compromise on her hopes and her dreams in what's kind of a shady world of 1960s New York. It feels very relevant to today, and it's got a great score and great choreography. And we've teamed it up with Bill Buckhurst directing, who um, had a major hit with his production of Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd in London, and it's currently ru- still running, keeps getting extended in New York. And choreographer Alistair David, who's been doing amazing work at Sheffield Crucible on their Christmas musicals for uh, several years. And he did Seven Brides for Seven Brothers in London last year. He's a, you know, so they're really exciting artists who will put a brand new spin on a classic, basically. OK, so looking back, how did you get the theatre bug? <laughs> well, f- f- I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but through Nottingham Playhouse, genuinely. Um, my parents brought me to the pantomime, you know, to see Kenneth Allen Taylor write, direct and then star in the pantomime. You know, and we still have Kenneth. He, he, no, he no longer plays the Dane, but he still writes and directs every year. And I remember walking into the auditorium as a child and the, the buzz is right. It was an adrenaline rush the atmosphere within there sitting with I guess it's that thing of that very human thing of sitting with a group of people and collectively having a live experience and then as I said before I, that then led to seeing a, a much wider variety of shows when I was a teenager I do remember one year being asked to um, at the pantomime it must have been six or seven being asked to get up on stage we still do it actually we get six children up to do the song sheet to learn the song at the end of the show and I was too scared when the usher asked me so I declined and and I really regretted it and I couldn't wait till the following year to be asked again and I was never asked and I was never asked again so I never got to go up on stage so in some ways now running Nottingham Playhouse I think is sort of is the prize you know it's it's been a long time coming. (laughs) You trained as an actor but Mm. you didn't go down that route why was that? So age 18 I auditioned to go to uh, the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts, LIPA, which is the kind of drama school that Paul McCartney started, to do the acting course. It was on a bit of a whim, (laughs) I won't won't be honest. I had a a friend who was a couple of years above me at the youth theatre who'd gone there, so I sort of just followed in his tracks. I didn't actually look at any other drama schools or audition for them. And And it was the only drama school I applied for. I'd applied to read English at universities. And I got a place at uh, Leeds to read English or at Lippa to study drama and felt like I should, give, you know, I might regret it if I didn't go to the drama school. But within weeks of starting that course, I realised it wasn't really for me. And I was going to drop out, but then Lippa are fantastic in terms of they realise that you're, the more, the more um, skills you have in our very competitive industry, the more you're going to increase your chances of work. So they'll nurture you as a musician alongside being an actor or a writer. And in my case, I started to realise I was interested in directing. So although I knew that I was always going to be a director, I finished that three-year degree in acting, doing a lot of directing on the side. And I wouldn't change that at all. It, it means that when I'm in a rehearsal room with actors, I feel very at home and I, and I think... I just have a common, I share a common language with them. I think it really helps. You worked at the National for several years. Mm. What was that like as an experience? Well, that was fantastic. I mean, that's where I sort of learnt not everything, but a huge amount. Um, I was very lucky to Nick Heitner, who the then artistic director of the National Theatre, took me under his wing a little, I guess. Um, I assisted Marianne Elliott, first of all, on an Alan Akebourne which is where I met Mark Gatiss, interestingly. And then I was Nick Heitner's assistant on One Man, Two Governors, which at first was, he sort of said, oh, well, we're doing A Servant of Two Masters, the Carlo Goldini Commedia dell'arte play. Do you want to assist on it? And I sort of thought, well, oh, that sounds a bit dry and dusty, to be honest. Anyway, it turned into One Man, Two Governors, um, obviously a major hit. And I then got moved up from being an assistant to a resident director and then associate director and then the revival director which essentially meant that I was directing Nick's production with brand new casts in the West End, on Broadway, around the world, Australia. So that was an amazing experience. 
had learnt a huge amount. And I also assisted, or was it Nick's associate, on the National Theatre 50th anniversary celebrations a couple of years ago, when we got to work with Maggie Smith, Judy Dench, Michael Gambon, Derek Jacobi, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Helen Mirren, I mean, everybody. And that, that is a once-in-a-lifetime experience that I suspect will never be topped. But why did you leave the National? Well, I was only working there freelance. It just so happened that I was going from project to project there and, and I directed various shows for their education department. I was then given uh, my own Alan Aitborn show in the Olivier Theatre, which was an amazing experience. But then uh, Nick left as artistic director. Rufus Norris took over, who I have a lot of time for. I love Rufus. I think he's a great artist, a very generous man, doing interesting work at the National. But it was a good opportunity for me to go and work at other theatres, particularly regionally at that time. So I worked at the Watermill, I worked at Salisbury Playhouse. More recently, I worked at the Don Mar. The National is amazing and the skill set is fantastic and it's a great institution. But it's one of a kind and actually it is good to work at other organisations to that have receive a bit less money, essentially. And, 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 you know, it teaches you other things, I guess. So now you're here at Nottingham Playhouse as the artistic director. Is that a daunting prospect for you? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a bit of daunting. Um, I only started full time two weeks ago, although I was appointed over a year ago. So it's been a very long handover, which is partly because uh, I had other commitments and projects in my diary that I needed to fulfil. But also it's a allowed me to really find my feet. Giles Croft, who I'm taking over from, has been really generous, so I've been able to learn an awful lot for him, as has Stephanie Sir, the chief exec. And actually everyone in the organisation has been really welcoming. So, I mean, artistic directors are weird. There is no training course for artistic directors, really. There are definite similarities with being a theatre director, but there's a huge amount of stuff which you just have to learn on the job and make mistakes and take the guidance of others. So... It's occasionally daunting, but actually more from not. It's really exciting. And it's you're learning stuff every day. I kind of relish that. Giles Croft was here for 18 years. So is he going to be a hard act to follow? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Giles, 18 years is a long time for an artistic director. And, and some of the stuff that Giles has accomplished during that time is amazing. You know, he has produced over 50 new plays in the 18 years he's been here. That I don't, I don't know if that's... Um, if anyone else has d- done the equivalent of that regionally elsewhere in the UK, I suspect not. It's, it's really admirable. He knows the city and the local art scene inside out. So I'm doing a lot of catching up there. Um, and he's well respected both within the organisation and within the industry regionally and nationally. So, yeah, he's a really tough act to follow. And they've had some huge successes. You know, Kite Runner, which Giles uh, you know, commissioned and directed, is... You know, it's played the set playhouse several times. It's been in the West End. It's on tour now. There's future plans for it. So projects like that are, if you can find the right project, which manages to find the perfect balance of being commercially viable and also loved and adored by audiences, that's the, that's the golden ticket, really. So, yeah, I've got to try and find one of those quite quickly. So what would you say is going to be your biggest challenge as artistic director here? Well, I mean, I I touched on the fact that we're all being squeezed. All arts organisations are being squeezed because local authority funding is disappearing, but that's because they're being squeezed in turn by the government. So that is a real challenge. We're having to, all theatres are having to look at what their funding models are now and try and make more earned income to replace that public subsidy, which is disappearing. But there's absolutely a breaking point, and I think... You know, talking to other artistic directors and chief execs of various organisations regionally, uh, you know, that's a real challenge. And I think there will be a breaking point at some point. So we've got to keep arguing the case for for, for arts funding. Um, so that's a major challenge. Nurturing the audience, bringing the audience with me and in a new, you know, whenever there's a shift of artistic leadership automatically some people don't like change that's perfectly understandable um i don't always like change so it's making sure we take that audience with us whilst building a new audience there's room for artist uh, audience development within the organization Uh, you know we do fairly well in terms of sales but we absolutely could do better so that's a that's the big challenge that hopefully the 2018 program that we've just announced starts to address
You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.